What's happening guys and welcome back to Sliced. I feel like I haven't done a video in so long for YouTube, but you know what, it's just been a bit of a crazy week last week. For those of you that don't follow me on Instagram, I was basically working with a masjid and we were sort of working through half term to bring in donations and sort of distribute food out to kids who needed it. So I've been a bit quiet on the whole YouTube side of things. But we're back today with an original food recipe, something that I'm so excited about. I've probably put the most research and effort into this recipe out of anything else because I know it's so heavily contested. Today, we are looking at jollof rice. Before I actually go into the history of where jollof rice originated from, I kind of really wanted to touch upon the current affairs that are going on in Nigeria at the moment. I feel like it's really important in the sort of journey of respect that I have for this dish that we take a look at how we can support the countries that these foods are attributed to. So with that being said, it's something that I could talk about myself, but I wanted to give up this platform to my friend Ayo, who can talk about it way better than I can. I'm going to hand it over to him right now. Jazakalaka Yusuf for having me on. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what your jollof rice looks like. Um, sadly, I cannot taste any um, because of the lockdown. Um, but yeah, inshallah, maybe you can save some for me. Um, but just to speak about Nigeria, it's a country of very rich history, um, very rich heritage. Um, there are over 350 ethnic groups uh, there, each with their individual language and culture. Um, and so, you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been seeing what's been going on with the SARS policing unit, how they've been committing loads of different abuses, um, you know, targeting young people um, because they've got dreadlocks or because, uh, um, you know, just uh, um, uh, profiling them generally um, and assaulting them, uh, killing them. Um, all these kind of things have been happening for years now. And it actually fits into a wider um, system of structural oppression and corruption that the Nigerian government have been committing for decades now. And so it's not just a struggle against the policing unit, it's a struggle uh, for justice, it's a struggle, you know, um, for the Nigerian people to get out of poverty that the government has uh, um, pushed onto them. It's a struggle for uh, um, a government and a country um, which, uh, um, you know, conducts itself by honest values and has respect for its people and actually works for its people and doesn't just put money into their own pockets. So there's so, so, so much going on. So I just ask you to make uh, the hour for the, the, the Nigerian people and oppressed communities around the world. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to that jello fries, inshallah. Guys, I'll leave some more reading for you in the description below, so go ahead and take a look at that if you're more interested in reading up and taking some action in this particular issue. But yeah, jello fries. If you follow Twitter trends, you'll know that the Jollof Wars have been going on between Nigerian Jollof and Ghanaian Jollof for years. 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 I always get rinsed for how I say that. I don't care. But what if I told you that Jollof, while it may be very popular in Nigeria and Ghana, didn't actually originate from there? So before the modern day sort of naming of countries, we had tribes. And so the Wolof tribe was a really prominent tribe in Western Africa, which is where Jollof has said to have been originated from. The Wolof Empire is now sort of Senegal, Gambia and Mauritania. However, Jollof is sort of more specifically attributed to Senegal itself. So around the 14th to the 16th century is where this would have sort of come about. This is where Senegal started cultivating rice and stuff like that. And so apparently it actually started as an accident. So instead of having the usual barley that they had, the woman who created it used some of this rice and she also put fish inside it. Bear in mind, jollof is a very regional dish. So Senegal is a coastal country and so it makes sense that they had fish in their jollof. This is now something which has spread across many African countries and they all have their different twists to it. In Togo, it has beans in it. Senegal still has fish in it. Different countries put in different vegetables and meat and serve with different things. But it all sort of comes from this base recipe and it's really quite fascinating how things have translated. Even if you want to go a bit deeper than that, when the slaves were brought over from West Africa over to America, in the Southern America, you have things like jambalaya and gumbo, these sort of red sauce based dishes. And it's really interesting how a lot of people actually attribute the sort of origin of that all the way to jollof. It's something that I really touched upon in my other videos as well about how American foods that were brought over by slaves are sort of translations of the foods that they would have been used to in Africa, which I think is really fascinating. Tragic, but fascinating. And again, it just goes to show how that memory of food, that culture of food can never be removed. It's something that we should always try and respect. I mean, look, that's been a very brief sort of abridged history of jollof. You could go into it in a lot more detail, but I do recommend you to do your own sort of reading around it. There are some really interesting articles out there. I'll try and leave a few links below. But look, this is not to take away from anyone's jollof because I've seen so many videos of jollof around the different sort of parts of Western Africa. And let me just say, it all looks so beautiful. But I think jollof is one of those amazing things that just sort of unifies all these sort of countries together. And I think actually, rather than saying that the difference 
separates these countries. I think it makes it actually a lot closer. It lets you appreciate the different regions and the sort of like ingredients that have gone into their particular jollof itself. But yeah, with that being said, let's actually get into our jollof recipe. So we have our jollof rice first. We're gonna take our rice and make a sort of stewed tomato, sort of spicy kind of sauce, which is that kind of red pepper sauce. I'm also going to reserve some of that obeata sauce and season some chicken with it and grill that, making it really nice and caramelized and serve that with our rice. And I also have some plantain which I'm going to fry up and serve alongside that, making our dish complete. In order to make this, and I'm making it for about eight people comfortably, we're going to use 700 grams of basmati sela rice. Now you can use any type of long grain rice, but basmati sela rice is basically parboiled rice, it's also referred to as, and it's just a lot more forgiving and it produces really nice individual grains when it's cooked through. So if you can get your hands on basmati sela rice, it's quite affordable, you can get it in almost every sort of Asian supermarket. I would definitely get your hands on that. If not, regular basmati rice will do. It just makes your life a little bit easier. Next up, we have three red onions. I'm keeping one to the side. Three red bell peppers. One scotch bonnet. You can use two or more if you'd like. I'm obviously making this for my family, so I don't want to like, you know, blow anyone's taste buds off. So we're just going with one scotch bonnet. I'm using four maggi cubes. You can use gnaw cubes. Any kind of stock cube will do, or just kind of boost that flavor. Um, just to clarify, because like I made a mistake, um, I meant four Maggi cubes, not four boxes. So even though I put four boxes in this picture, um, just to clarify, I am talking about four cubes, which, so I, I, I moved it down to two boxes because each box had two cubes. So yeah, four of those little Maggi cubes, not the whole boxes. And of course, if you want to make it vegetarian, use vegetarian stock cubes, absolutely fine. Two tablespoons of hot or mild curry powder. I'm using hot curry powder. You can use a Jamaican or an Asian curry powder. Both are absolutely fine. I'm going in with one bunch of thyme, one whole head of garlic, four tablespoons of tomato paste. I'm using an 800 gram tin of whole tomatoes. Optionally as well, you can put in two bay leaves when you cook your rice, but just to make the sauce, we're gonna take our two red onions I'm actually going to chop mine pretty finely because I'm using a stick blender, but if you've got like a proper full-on blender, then just use the onions like in halves or quarters or whatever. But I'm going to chop my onions pretty fine, as well as my bell peppers. When it comes to the scotch bonnet, do not bother cutting that thing in half because it's just going to spread all the sort of like, you know, oils everywhere. It's going to really burn everything that you touch. So just take that green stem off and pop the whole thing in and just blend that as it is. I'm adding in my curry powder. I'm gonna strip the sort of thyme leaves off the stem and just put that in as well. I'm gonna peel my garlic. I know it seems like a lot of garlic, but I just love garlic. If you don't, then just use less. Also, if you don't, like what's wrong with you? Garlic is amazing, but still go ahead and add that in. Adding in my tomato paste and I'm going to add in some water just to help it blend. Doesn't really matter how much water you add in because we're actually gonna cook this down so all the water will evaporate anyway. So if you need to add loads of water to help it like blend up, that's calm because you're just gonna end up evaporating it anyway. I'm gonna blend this up until it's a nice smooth sort of puree and I'm going to heat up a pan with some oil and add in that sauce, cooking it down exactly like you would with a normal curry base if you've made curry before. And it's just gonna sort of reduce that down and the oil will start to separate um, and come to the top. That's how you know your sauce is cooked, all the spices have cooked out and it's gonna be so nice and fragrant. At this point, give it a taste and season it with some salt. If you season it with salt at the beginning, it would concentrate and become too salty and you don't want that. So just add enough salt at the end so that it's to your taste. And while that's cooking down, what I'm gonna do is take my 700 grams of basmati rice and wash it to remove the extra starch. I'm gonna do this a couple times just to remove the extra starch. I've actually seen recipes where they don't wash the rice because there's a lot of oil and fat in this recipe and so it will actually coat the rice, preventing it from sticking too much but just as force of habit, I'm washing my rice. And so what I'm gonna do, removing, I'd say, just a few spoons of my sauce. I'm going to add in my rice back to this, giving it a stir, making sure every grain is coated with this beautiful seasoning, and then fill it up with water just enough so that it reaches the, oops, just so that it reaches that sort of mark just below that, kind of there. I'd say like that two centimeters. And we're gonna bring this to a boil and then simmer it right down for a solid like 10, 15 minutes and just leave it covered so that it can steam. And once it's cooked through, we're just gonna fluff it up and then let it sit on the side. At this point, you can also add a couple knobs of butter if you would like, but I feel like it's got enough oil in the dish anyway. I don't wanna add too much fat. And then we can go ahead and move on to the chicken. Now, with the chicken, I would honestly say prepare that as you wish. There are so many variations for how chicken is prepared across West Africa. One thing which is quite common though is chicken served as a street food where they'll marinate it in some spices 
and grill it over an open flame, which I think is really beautiful. I love that smoky kind of flavor. So what I'm gonna do is use the rest of my obeata sauce and massage it all over these chicken legs. I've gone with skin on because I want that skin to get nice and crispy. And what I'm gonna do is preheat my oven to about 220 degrees. This is about gas mark seven, I'd say, maybe gas mark six. Yeah, depending on your oven. Just get your oven really nice and hot. Spread your chicken out evenly over a wide sort of pan or tray. And we're gonna roast this for about 15 to 20 minutes, giving it some really nice color. Just checking if it needs more color. You can whack up the heat a bit more. You can, you can flip it, just give it a little cut inside, make sure it's cooked. It might even end up going for like 25, 30 minutes just to make sure it's fully cooked because it's dark meat. We'll just get that really nice and cooked. And while that's happening, we can take a look at our plantain. I know some people say plantain, but we're saying plantain for this. So if you say it differently, let me know in the comments. And if you look at this, you might think that this is incredibly overripe if you're not used to seeing plantain before. But I would honestly say, do not be afraid of it. It's totally not like a banana in that it will be super soft. That is actually a perfectly ripe plantain. You want there to be sort of speckles of yellow going through it, but you want it to be majority black. That indicates the ripeness because it's a very, it's a very starchy sort of, as a kind of a fruit, I guess. It's very starchy and that ripeness allows it to soften just enough. And so you want to give it a squeeze and just like you would with a peach, for example, you want it to be firm but have a little bit of softness on the outside. That's how you know it's ripe. If it's totally mushy, it's gonna be a bit difficult to fry and it might be too sweet. And if it's too firm, you're just not gonna enjoy it. So make sure it's nice and soft to touch on the outside but still has that firmness. What I'm gonna do is peel it taking the top and bottom off and just making a nice cut all the way through. And you can cut it at any angle that you want. I actually wanna make this quite presentable, so I'm gonna make long sort of slices all the way through it so I can get these nice long pieces of plant and I think it'll look really nice. And I'm gonna sort of, mm, I'd say it's a deep fry, it's more an in-between, between shallow and deep, but I just want enough oil that it's gonna cover each individual sort of slice. I'm using some cooking oil, use a high smoking point cooking oil, don't use something like olive oil. I know some people fry plantain in coconut oil as well. And once it's come up to the right heat, I'm going to fry it, making sure it's nice and golden. That's another thing as well, make sure your plantain isn't cut too, too thick, that you have it golden on the outside and it's still not fully cooked on the inside. Make it thin enough so that it can cook nicely. Once that's out, you can drain it on a piece of tissue and give it a nice season with a small pinch of sea salt. And now we can put the whole thing together and what can I say except Lord have mercy. My little catchphrase was made for a dish like this. It's so beautiful and it has an even more beautiful history. Something which spreads across West Africa. And while it originates in Senegal, it's something that creates beautiful culture across West Africa and around the world as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's recipe. Hope you learned a little something as well. Please like, subscribe, put the notifications on, follow me on my socials at slash underscore YT on like every platform. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.